Christmas at Rawlinson End Part 1 Cannibalism at the Synagogue Or You can have your kike and eat it The story so far Sir Henry has been reading Home Doctor and with his characteristic generosity to the underprivileged offered his converted garage workshop a newly acquired expertise to the needy villagers those owing rent to Rawlinson End invent all manner of disease for Henry's ready knife well, actually a well-honed sabre sterilised with the breath of a rabid dog Great Aunt Flory turns her hand to lobotomy high botany and occasionally medium botany which involves going into a trance with the patient lobotomy is misunderstood by some of the illiterates and Flory is horrified when presented with several rude country bums old Seth one tooth actually stood on his head or tried to because he had a boil on the back of his neck I don't want to seem morbid but did you see his face before he died? asked Gerald. Horrible! Looked as though he'd died of fear. Ralph is in mid Atlantic and Sandra still smells. Now read on dot 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 dot. It was true. Ralph is coming home. For the first time in twelve years, and the idea of seeing Roxanne stirs and excites him. Roxanne, her young breasts like hunting dogs straining at the leash. He wondered if anything had changed. A dozen years, yet it seemed, only the day before yesterday when clear-eyed, spruce and eager, or Bruce-eyed, drunken Frank Ifield, he'd left for South America. He stared down moodily at the green-scaled flying fish, skipping and fluttering over the waves. A po-faced steward lay under the bed. A po-faced steward reminded him that second sitting for luncheon was already well entrenched in the entree. The man had the simian posture and cerebral stature of a pygmy. Ralph wasn't hungry. A middle-aged drunk in a Bavarian hat belched onto the deck and offered Ralph a swig from a greasy bottle of entre deux legs. When Ralph declined, he tried to kiss him. Ralph refused, so the man bit his leg. It was extremely painful. And after some minutes, Ralph said, Oh, all right, then. But the man seemed to have lost interest and started yodelling over the rail, some curious song about talented tortoises. Oh, please, didn't it torture my totty? It is near his fault at all. He may seem a teeny bit naughty, but he's played at the Albert Hall. He's naked with things... Mandolins, violins, he just can't freight the strings, which sometimes he sings, and it's no that he's naughty. Pianos is forty. Apart from that, he can't play bugger all. <clears throat> he then told Ralph an obscure joke about a giant octopus that left awful squid marks on the seabed. Ralph didn't get it. Meanwhile, Back at the great house, Hubert Maynard arrived. Dear, dear Hubert. In his middle forties, and yet he was still unusual. He would throw himself naked onto the lawn in a northerly direction parallel to the earthly axis. And lying on his back was that loathsome Roman clock face, tattooed around his lower and private parts, tell the time with astounding accuracy, if he thought about Jean Harlow. Look, no hands, auntie, he would screech. Now check that, my darling Tim, huh? In the winter, he tried with a candle, but it hurt, and he was invariably hours late anyway. 
So he contented himself by standing in the main hall and inviting visitors to stand on his feet. He would then tell their weight in a dreadful monotone and at the same time present them with a cigarette card depicting steam engines or early flying machines. Henry tried with him and spent a whole afternoon persuading him of the future in hat stands. But when Henry mentioned the umbrellas, Hubert told him where to stuff it. Naturally, as an Englishman, Henry stoutly accepted. Anyway, he told Hubert that if he didn't put a sock on the sundial business, he'd soon be singing soprano. In Southampton, Ralph had docked. He expected Timothy and Letitia to be there at what strange children they were. And that nasty friend of theirs with a the squint, Gerald. Clapped a nose. What went on behind the locked nursery doors after they chummed up with him? Always bringing pets into the house. Must be healthy for children, he supposed. But that thing they'd made, a horrid hybrid cross between a gorilla and a parrot, and they'd let it loose in the maze. It was feathered, huge, and immensely strong, and would spring from the privet at odd moments and grasp one round the neck and ask, Who's a pretty boy, then? Still, it kept the tramps off the premises. Then there was that weird chant of theirs, arms linked, to the rhythm of knives, something about poodles and chopping. We are three vivisectionists. We go out at night with big brown sacks, commandeering little cats. They sometimes bite, they sometimes scratch, but in the end they meet their man with a... A poodle. A poodle of little or no consequence. Secreted at night as he peed up a door. The poor little... He was somebody's pet. But with scalpels and needles no more. Quick and vivial. Well, con vivial vivisectionists. We take out animals' brains. We prize them out and peep inside. And... We put them back again. We put them back again. Oh, hum. No welcoming committee. But ironically, he was closer to family than he knew, for his brother Arbuthnot was nearby. At first, earnestly hemming his way out to sea in a dinghy, but now in trouble at a place called Dead Man's Point. The currents there were strong, treacherous and unpredictable. He was soaked to the shirt, and his sandwich tin floated in the scuppers. Dead Man's Point, that name! A memory cord strummed softly. Of course, he remembered the accident, then darkness, and the soft, probing hand of the doctor. At least he said he was a doctor. It was like a bad case of Alice, he said. We're not sure how it gets into the bloodstream, but uh, Christopher Robin went down with it. It was then that Ralph noticed the tiny boat and heard his brother's screams for help. Tossing down his suitcases, in moments with many powerful strokes, Ralph combed his hair and smartened up a stray cat. This was unusual, because Ralph hated combing his hair then he gouged and bullied his way towards the rank and got into a taxi. Tomorrow, the fate of Arbathnot, the feet of Sandra. Won't you come home, Israeli? Uncle Otto gets blotter. Three cones in a fountain and rabbis keep falling on my head. 
Christmas at Rawlinson End, Part 2. Uncle Otto gets blotto. During the night, the snow came and mattressed the vast acreage of Rawlinson End. The windows clouded and icicles hung, crystalline and lovely from old Scrotum's nose. From the drive, a jingling and a barking of giant schnauzers heralded the unexpected arrival of Uncle Otto, who, with his lederhosen, boots and shoulder-length moustache, looked faintly distinguished. He yodelled for a while, taking constant swigs from a hip flask of schnapps, and began biting things, while his men in sombre grey with red, white and black armbands unloaded the great trunks of sausage. Sir Henry stared at Otto's knees and frowned. Otto's knees were tense and muscular, not unlike the face of a landlord when you have to explain that you've run out of ground and could he possibly wait till next term. Otto Goose stepped up the drive and, raising his right arm, barked, Heil, carpet chewer! Then, rudely brushing past Sir Henry, he kicked the door, which was open anyway, and with the assistance of three of his men and a tape measure, began immediately to measure the servants' heads. Now read on. Dot. Arbuthnot snuffed it, but nobody knows that yet, except you and I. So lie doggo for a bit, and with any luck we'll ruin the lunch. There was a terrific crash, and a brick smashed through the window of the family chapel. About the brick was wrapped a note which simply said, Hello, I'm your new neighbour. Henry was plainly delighted. <laughs> Seems a decent enough egg, he grunted. At least he didn't have the impertinence to present himself at the front door. But who was he? Hubert was out on the icy tennis court, practising serves with a neighbourly hedgehog, which didn't do the rackets much good, as the hedgehog, new to the game, kept dropping one. Meanwhile, in Soho, snug, in Cathartocles' Kazi Kebab and Curry House, Ralph's unnatural cousin, Harold Maynard, was stiffening up to order a real barbed wire bum burner. I say, what say, uh, we say, just for starters, Kandori Koipu Sagosht, that's a 33 47, and a spot of uh, 69, if I can get enough gin down you. <laughs> A chap, well, it's a good Bombay duck. What? After taking a chap ass out for a blowout? He smirked to the porcelain young thing. He was so desperately trying to impress. <laughs> she, <laughs> duh. And wondered opaquely what all this was going to cost her in terms of flesh. Stand up, the fellow who hasn't got an Arthur Rackham pinned on his blasted wall, eh? porcelain thing remained mute. Perry knew lots about art. Manny and Monny, the Jewish boys. Pissaro, the Irishman. Van Gogh, who lent his name to a wine to buy canvas. Picasso, who suffered from piles. Machiavelli, the amazing Scottish-Italian impressionist. Bird impressions, he ate worms. People impressions, he ate birds. Etc. He ate badgers. In Southampton, Ralph was going through customs. Mostly nasty, sticky stuff he'd picked up in the tropics. The one involving the ritual use of goiters was especially horrid. The tropics, damn them. Murderous, yet 
curiously magnetic. Already he missed them. Collecting and studying the myriad Corridorus catfish and their legion barbled brothers in the steaming waters of the Orinoco was scarcely work for a milksop. He smiled grimly, and his shorts flapped majestically over his blunt, honest knees. Those whiskery rascals. But getting hold of the blighters, he'd swam rapids, wrestled anacondas, and she's a big girl, and still came back to the bar, covered in gore, dressed as John Wayne, to ask, Where was that blasted Eskimo woman? He had two skin? Question mark. Through sheer brute understanding, he'd forced the affections of savage headhunters and their wonderful families. Cravat high in rivers shimmering with piranha, swift, vicious fishes that can reduce a man to a Giacometti skeleton in seconds. The leeches, the mosquitoes, David Attenborough. He shuddered to think of it. But here he was. He'd got through. And yet, even in the liner's tiny blue-tiled swimming pool, he still carried a great curved knife in his excellent teeth for his daily plunge, often reeking and sometimes causing compulsory acupuncture amongst the water wings and floating couches. Meantime, young John has discovered some ancient puppadums that Sir Henry had brought back from Bombay and insists on playing them as loudly as possible on the wind-up gramophone. But Otto has put a stop to that. The acoustics in the bathroom were also gewöhnlich. And Otto spent a lot of time practicing his tuba technique in preparation for the grand luncheon. Tomorrow, Arbuthnot's fate revealed. Sander's feet reviled. The arrival of Candice. Otto discovers my life boy soap in the downstairs bathroom and Henry starts a fish war. Ralph arrives and Justin thinks of a novel and amusing way to inflate balloons. Also more about the new show. Christmas at Rawlinson M part three. Ralph heaves too. The story at once. Sir Henry has put so much brandy into the pudding that, much to great Aunt Florrie's chagrin, it has thrown up over the side of the bowl and has to have a lie down on the kitchen floor before being put into the oven to be cooked. Timothy and Letitia have made the mince pies which smell very meaty. Stefan has gripped Delhi but promises to play at the party, so that's all right. Meanwhile, Henry has had his Christmas trousers steamed and pressed. They are 18 inches too big about the waist, and Henry says, as always, Burst him or bust. Sandra still smells. So what do I tell the Pentagon? Now read on. Tomorrow, tomorrow, and Tommy Rot, interjected Ralph. Tomorrow, we celebrate the birth of the infant, breathed Great Aunt Flory, her wells filling with tears. But well, what the deuce to expect the birth of an adult rhinoceros? Chortled Sir Henry, already the worst of sobriety. Funny you should say that, sir, ventured Gerald. I've already popped down to St. Barclays and rearranged the crib in anticipation of your wishes. With the arrival of the exceedingly beautiful and wayward Candice, four husbands and a broken affair behind her, celebration stopped. Candice was a notorious liar and also something of a seer 
and would stare for hours into Cousin Otto's false eye, dressed in a seamless gown of silver and blue. Candice herself wore a white nightie. Poor Otto lay on his back with his glass eye taped open. At least it didn't interfere with his sleep. In fact, Otto refused strongly during the daytime. Don't let it, he would spit. If it's lying on me to be all the time on a billiards table and a sh- 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 incense, also the chanting going on, I'm not enjoying. Why, the Fuhrer himself, when he has a few moments alone with his euphonium and miles, an elite division of the SS and Ava, of course, on backup vocals, keyboards and synthesizer, can sing the carpet, choo-choo, cha-cha, the Reichstag, Bonger, Rumble, and so weiter. This, for me, was a crystal night Christmas. But you, you expect silent night without so much as a curfew. Candice made a splendid entrance. Her freakishly long legs harlequined with wisteria and pendulous begonia. A stride? Why, anyone could pass between, and, having passed, pass out with the maddening intoxication of her fragrant wafts. She intoned. Frata Otto, Otto, Otto. Completely blotto. A feat be my motto, Otto, Otto. To me, reveal the numbers. We have here a full house. Laos and stone bring obedience. And from one throat... Bingo! All must dance. Clickety-click, clickety-click, clickety-clickety-click. Click, click. The house was daily nuisance by Cousin Willie and his seemingly meaningless morning yell at the sun. Hail to thee, who art Ra in thy rising, and in thy lying down, and also when you're out doing the shopping. Ra, ra, ra! Ra, ra, ra! Willie insisted on being addressed as Frater Omnia the Brink, and even before going to the toilet, would throw chopsticks about and peer into, or consult, as he put it, a book called Itching. Flory suggested calamine lotion to stop it, but Willie insisted it had nothing to do with eczema, and anyway it was pronounced yiking. And Henry said it sounded like something a gentleman would do behind a handkerchief. There was a startlingly loud chorus of Why is bacon so tough? played on tuned car horns, which seemed to come from Rhonda's womb. Uh, Wanda's room. She always makes that noise when going into a trance, said Arbuthnot, who was dead. Why the deuce she had to go to India to learn yoga, I can't imagine. Not that I like the stuff, but the milkman's quite happy to deliver it. Same with chickens, except they keep dropping the bottles. And, well, frankly, it makes me sick. Filthy beggars. Not that I have anything against the lower orders, but damn they don't even use paper to wipe their bottoms cracky. I spent years out there in the service teaching them... By example, the value of rubies, slave labour, and the export of hashish. But turbans and independence aside, I don't mind bowing, but better if I'll shake hands. Next week. Wait, who made that smell? Who made that smell of the studio? Who let Sandra in? Or has John been at the red cabbage again? Next time... Aubrey catches a nasty. Otto donates his trousers to a flea circus and the beginning of the assault course luncheon. Gerald chooses Sir Henry's gout stocking to hang over his bed and there is a bit of a to-do. Also, all jugglers must have Latin American music. Why? And they grin and look surprised. At the music?
Christmas at Rawlinson End. Part 4. Boxing Day. And a right royal flush. Together, Rawlinson's and Maynard's made a pretty impressive lump. Defiant and impregnable. And it took old Scrotum and some strong lads from the village with turpentine and fork to separate them. Incest was rumoured, but it was mainly Old Spice and the crooked cheroots that Ralph had brought back from South America. There was talk. Typically, Henry dismissed this as malicious truth, and the gathering outside the fool and bladder was swelled by elephantiasis and gossip. Splendid in his hunting pink, he straddled the lively, strong-made turret of his tank, and with a stirring blast from a recent curry, we don't. Alone, he took a mere machine gun and wiped out a whole set of badgers. Huh, that beats philately, he chuckled. Meanwhile, Algy was tackling a murmuration of starlings. All of this was fine if Ralph, who had mastered horseback billiards at the early age of eleven and not having access to a full-sized table since his return from the tropics, was not to be persuaded from playing South American snooker, even during these sessions, which made uh, the invocation of Horus on the part of Candice rather difficult, and slumber on the part of Uncle Otto almost impossible. Because, despite the constant cracks on his immaculately shaven skull, every time Ralph shouted, Put Black! Otto would stiffly wake up and, grasping a cue, squint horribly along it until he was convinced they were all dead and that the iron cross with oak leaves would be his before the dawn. Bing, bing, bing! He would shout until he was tranquilized with a blue ball to send a pocket from Ralph. It was always a pleasure to see Doris until she opened her mouth which, considering her ivory teeth and needed daily attention with a dilution of nitric acid, was not so much of a pleasure. To his pleasure, Gerald has been given a lovely new scalpel and had offered to make the cranberry sauce. He does, and it's very good. But Nigel is worried and spends most of the lunch under the table looking for his corgi, Leo. All the way from the village... There was a torchlight procession from the ruddy-faced workers. But why didn't they move? Bash the tables, fill the glass, stuff the turkey right. Sob the neighbors, sing out strong tonight, we'll all get tight. Write the home with red balloon, green the mistletoe. Or raw. Sing up standing while you can, or bellow from the floor. Hang the tree with village lads, toss them scraps of meat. Now bring in the village maids while we're still on our feet. Take your wind and loose your stays, ladies first to start. Gentlemen together now, let us hear you shout. As was customary, Blinkers O'Connor, the blind poacher, was there. And he clambered onto the table amidst the noise of snoring and mistook two blancmanges for a woman. This resolved, he clambered up on top of Sir Henry, elevating himself some four feet. Blinkers was renowned in the village, for he'd entered a field, intent on snatching, and encountered a bull which he'd wrestled with and won, and had afterwards boasted at the fallen bladder 
that if he'd got the blighter off his bike, he'd have murdered him. This said, he threw back his head, caught it, and let loose with a song which Otto, were he not snoring in his steel helmet, would have loathed. Hear now the sad story of poor Edward Walsh Who thought all religion was just so much bolsh Brought up as a Catholic He tried so hard Genuflecting, confessing A loud A loud He tried He spoke with an old been in the war Who coughed but recalled all the things that he'd saw The gunpowder grey of the little sea Men died and when dying went home his turn to sing. The part is over now The dawn is drawing But in all The candles Got up The starlight Leaves the sky It's time For little girls and boys to hurry home to bed Oh, there's a new day waiting just ahead Time is sweet, but time is fleet beneath the magic of the moon Dancing time may seem sublime, but it has ended all too soon The thrill is gone 
to linger on would spoil it anyhow. Let's creep away from the day for the parties of the night. Night is over, dawn is breaking. Overhead, the town is waking. Just as we are on our way to sleep, lovers weep and dance a little, catching from romance a little souvenir of happiness to keep. The music of an hour ago was just a sort of let's pretend. The memories that charmed us so. At last, have ended. The part is over now. The dawn is drawing near. Got up. The starlight leaves the sky. It's time for little girls and boys to hurry home to bed. For there's a new day waiting just ahead. Time is fleet, but time is sweet beneath the magic of the moon. May seem sublime, but it's ending all too soon. A thrill has gone to linger on. Would spoil it anyhow. Let's creep away from the day for the parties of an.